We will use the k-means algorithm to segment the population of counties by the five PCA attributes we created previously. K-means is a clustering algorithm that identifies clusters of similar counties based on their attributes. As we have approximately 3000 counties and 34 attributes in our original data set, so the large feature space will make it difficult to cluster the counties effectively. So we have reduced the feature space to five PCA components and we will cluster on this transformed data set. Our transformed data set is in the counties underscore transformed variable. Let's see the values we have there. So here are our states with respective counties names. And we have our five selected components with their labels. And I have written here in the markdown format. And we have already discussed what these values for different states in counties represents. So before we apply the k-means algorithm, first thing first, we prepare data for Amazon SageMaker by extracting the NumPy array from the data frame and explicitly casting to float 32. Now we import the k-means module from the SageMaker library and then we call and define the hyperparameters of our k-means model as we have done with our PCA model. The k-means algorithm allows the user to specify how many clusters to identify. In this instance, let's try to find uh, the top five clusters from our data set. So the parameters have been defined and next we train the model on our training data set. Now, if we go to the training jobs here under the training in our SageMaker dashboard, you can see that the new job appears here with a complete status. Now, let's go back to the Jupyter Notebook. Now, we will deploy this model using the MLT2 medium single instance type. Let's run it and wait for it to execute. This will take a while, so I will end this lesson here. And we will continue from the next lab lesson on doing some prediction and gaining some insights this time for the k-means trained model attributes. So our model is now deployed. Let's start with first storing the predicted result in the result km variable. Now I will check the breakdown of cluster counts and the distributions of the clusters. All right, so here it shows the distributions of different clusters. So we have 1, 2, 4, 6 for the cluster 1 out of the total data points in our data set. Then we have 6, 3, 1 in our cluster 3 and so on for all the 7 clusters, numbers starting from 0 to 6. We can also see the same count with the help of the histogram. Let's run this code. So here we have the total cluster count for seven different clusters, where we see that the larger count is for cluster one. Now let's see which cluster is each data point assigned to. We can simply randomly select a few data points by indices and check their cluster information using the same indices. Using the random library function, here I'm selecting two random counties. Let's run this cell. And here it shows the two county results. Here is the first county, Illinois will. The first label as the closest cluster for which the value is zero. And the second label shows the distance to the cluster. And same can be seen for the second random cluster selected. We will now deep dive into the model attributes for the k-means algorithm. So as we did previously, first we will go to the training job. And here is the k-means training job name. Let's copy it and go back to the notebook. Paste it here. So we will unzip the model file in the same way we did for the PCA. Now 
let's load the model parameters in the variable k-mean model parameters. Now let's view it. There is one set of model parameters that is contained within the k-means model. Cluster centroid location is the location of the centers of each cluster that is identified by the k-means algorithm. The cluster location is given in our PCA transformed space with five components since we passed the transformed PCA data into the model. Let's see the values for the cluster centroids. So here are the values in the table for each cluster with reference to the five PCA components. Now we can plot a heat map of the centroids and their location in the transformed feature space. This gives us insight into what characteristics defined each cluster. Often with supervised learning, results are hard to interpret. So this is one way to make use of the results of PCA plus clustering techniques together. Since we were able to examine the makeup of each PCA component, we can understand what each centroid represents in terms of the PCA component that we interpreted previously. Let's run this cell to plot the heat map. So in the heat map, the darkest color represents a strong relation, whereas the lighter color represents a weak relationship. Let me change the component numbers of the PCA to their respective names to make things easier. Let's run these two cells. Alright, here we are now and we can see the cluster index number and the PC attributes names as well. For example, cluster 3 indexed as 2 has the highest value in the constructions and commuter attributes, while it has the lowest self-employment or public worker attribute compared with other clusters. We can also map the cluster labels back to each individual county and examine which counties were naturally grouped together. Let's name the previously used counties transformed to their respective names. And now in the second last cell, we will relate the counties with PCA attributes to their cluster group. Let's run it. And here we have a new column representing the cluster for each of the counties. Let's conclude our section with the closing remarks on what we did. So we walked through a data science workflow for unsupervised learning, specifically clustering a data set using k-means after reducing the dimensionality using PCA. By accessing the underlying models created within Amazon SageMaker, we were able to improve the explainability of our modeling and draw actionable conclusions. Using these techniques, we have been able to better understand the essential characteristics of different counties in the US and segment the electorate into groupings accordingly. Now at the end, as the endpoints are persistent, let's delete our endpoints. Now that we are done to avoid any excess charges on our AWS bill.